Last week, I talked about learning to love the bomb, about seeking the face of God in the darkness that blinds us and the suffering that pains us, about learning to love the things that we most wish had not or did not happen. The holiday we celebrate today is a prime example of that very thing. As we recall Reformation Sunday, we not only celebrate the renewal of Christ's church that came out of the persistent proclamation of a new generation of the church's leaders, we also must recall the insults and the anathemas hurled back and forth in God's name. The uh, excommunications and the broken relationships that followed. The burnings at the stake and the wars that were born out of that. It's a chapter of the church's history that we have come to love because it's made us who we are. It's a part of our identity as a people of God. But it is also so terrible that we should all wish that it had never happened. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrestles with understanding and explaining something very similar. When the Messiah lived and taught among us, he was rejected by the very people to whom he was sent, God's chosen people, Israel. Now it would appear that they had in this moment broken their covenant with God once and for all. And yet, as Paul points out, it is that very rejection by God's people that opened the way for the gospel to be spread to so many others. Their disobedience, he writes, has been the occasion for our experience of God's mercy. God chose Israel to be God's royal priesthood, to be the people who would bring the good news of God to the whole world. It seems that even in their apparent disobedience, they have done just that. So here's the question. Did God plan it all this way? Did God harden their hearts, so to speak, so that Israel would reject Jesus and the Gentiles would be welcomed in? I don't think so. But I also don't think that God is stupid. I think that God knows how humans react to the new ways that God presents the gospel to the world, because that's how humans have always reacted to the ways that God presents the gospel to the world. From the garden, to the ark, to the wilderness, to the cross, and beyond. And I think that God is creative enough, that God is clever enough, that most of all, God is loving enough to take even outright rejection and turn it for God's own purposes. This divine repurposing is what theologians call redemption. Because God is God, there is nothing that God cannot redeem. Not human sinfulness, not death, not even an act of pure evil, like killing God's son. Like some great judo master, God can take all the forces turned against God and redirect them so that they actually work for God's purposes. On this Reformation Sunday, as I read these words of Paul and of Jesus, and I think about this moment in history in which we find ourselves, this is where my mind goes. For decades now, people have been talking about the decline of religion about the death of Christianity. Several theologians think that maybe this is the moment when Christianity is due for another Reformation. And I find myself wondering if both of these viewpoints are not correct at the same time. What if this new thing that God is about to do is not so much another Reformation, as it is a death and a resurrection. I mean, consider for a moment what Christianity might look like 
if it had never split from Judaism. It might still be a relatively small world religion, tied almost exclusively to a particular ethnic group. The church may never have expanded beyond the Jewish people. And it would certainly have a different flavor, wouldn't it? The Christian experience of God would probably still be tied to some form of observance of the Law of Moses, with practices like circumcision or keeping kosher. It's not to say those would be bad things, but it would definitely be a different understanding of God than we have now. The death that occurred when Jewish-Christian unity was, was lost has certainly given rise to all manner of violence and hostility over the last 20 centuries, including some of our most horrendous atrocities. But it has also opened the, our eyes to a new way of experiencing God. Both the evil and the new life exist together. And now, because of that, Judaism and Christianity together offer a more nuanced and multifaceted view of God. Christianity may be due for another Reformation, but maybe a Reformation would only really bring renewal to those who already call themselves Christians, those who don't mind belonging to an organized religion. Perhaps the new thing that God has in mind is not a Reformation at all, but a new birth, the breathing into existence of something not yet even conceived, something that is not even what we would call a religion, but something what can, that can bear the truth of the good news to a people who could not or would not otherwise receive it. It might be that the next stage of what God is doing is without all of this. Speaking for myself, I'd be very excited to be a part of this new thing. I would be grateful to be part of sharing the good news of God's work to save and redeem creation with a whole new group of people who have no connection to the church, no desire for the trappings of organized religion, to find new ways to talk about God that don't involve $10 theological words and uh, white robes and funny scarves. But I'd also be lying if I said I wouldn't miss those things, those trappings, the liturgy, the hymns, the holidays, the traditions. The church has been my home for so long. It's the community shaped by these things that has been my refuge and strength through times of joy and sorrow. It's guided me in my transition from childhood into adulthood. It's been my touchstone through all the changes and uncertainties of life. I am afraid to set out on this new path, even while I am excited, because I will grieve what I would be leaving behind. And I think that I'm not the only one who feels this way. You see, following Jesus challenges us not only to allow ourselves to be reformed, but also resurrected. When we only see God in the pleasant and the comfortable and the familiar, those things become our refuge and our strength. They become the things to which we turn for help in times of trouble. But the psalmist doesn't say the synagogue is my refuge and strength. It doesn't say the Lutheran church is my refuge and strength. It doesn't say my religion or my faith is my refuge and my strength. They say, God is my refuge and my strength. God is my very present help in time of trouble. As long as we only see God in those beautiful things, we will remain enslaved to them, afraid of what exists outside of them. We will shun hardship and avoid pain, and we will cut ourselves off from the ways that God might be working in those things to bring about new life beyond all imagining. 
we will continue to live in the houses that we have built for God, the churches, the denominations, the religions, not realizing that these things are built with human hands. They're transient. And so we cannot abide there forever. But Jesus, Jesus offers us a place where we can abide forever, a place in God's presence place in God's house. But we don't always recognize that place as God's house. Sometimes that place looks like schism and destruction, like doubt and despair. Sometimes it looks like being cast out of the synagogue or excommunicated from the church. When it doesn't match our image of God's house, it can sometimes feel like the outer darkness filled with weeping and gnashing of teeth. It takes the ability to trust that God is in that, doubt, that outer darkness even, with us, to hope that God can redeem anything, even suffering and death. It takes that kind of trust to see that God is always creating us to be the people we are about to become. Children of God, this is true not just for you and me. This is not just true for the church. This is true of all creation, the entire world and all that dwells therein. I know that this moment in history is filled with fear and uncertainty. The fate of the church aside, there are many terrors that stalk the night. We fear COVID and climate change. We are worried about the outcome of the election and what it means for our nation and our world. We fear for the safety of refugees and we mourn for the separation of families at our border. We cry out until we are hoarse for justice for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others on that ever-growing list of names of black and brown lives lost to racism. We are sickened and scared by the fact that the water in Flint, Michigan is still poisonous and by the decades-long housing crisis right here in our own backyard. We live in the dread of sudden and random gun violence. This old world of ours, children of God, sometimes seems like it's on its last legs, raging, raging against the dying of the light. How often I find myself wondering how we can possibly survive much longer with things going in the direction they are headed. My only hope, children of God, is in the unsearchable judgments and the inscrutable ways of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who hung on the cross and walked out of the tomb, the God who has promised to redeem all things even these. I trust in God because I know, because I have seen that this God walks in the darkness as well as in the light. I know that God is walking through this dark hour with us, beloved, because as long as God walks with us, we have the love of God to carry us through, the love of God that created the world from nothing, the love of God that is at work even now, to redeem it, to turn it back from destruction and toward new life. God's love has the power to create the people and the world that we are becoming out of the people and the world that we now are, out of all of this mess of despair and destruction that surrounds us. So don't lose hope, beloved. Some things are dying now, it's true, but death is just a part of life. And for better or worse, the source of all life is God. I believe that the death we see now will be the next occasion for God to show us mercy. And that in that mercy, God is setting us free to be the people we are becoming. A people stronger, a people kinder a people gentler and more humble and more careful for what we are now experiencing. This road that we are walking, it is not peaceful or easy, 
I don't even think you could call it good. But the powerful and creating love of God will see us safely through, down this road to the next leg of our journey. When we eventually look back on these days, we will wish that they had never happened. But we will also be able to look on ourselves with love as the people that God will have formed us to be through the walking through of these days. All things come from God. All things exist through God. And all things belong to God. And so praise and glory we give to the God who is making all things new.